Hello again, and welcome to another episode of the Business of Business podcast. I'm your host, Roy. Of course, I am the. Uh, we are the podcast that brings you a wide variety of guests, uh, talk about a bunch of diverse topics to help you in business. We want to see everybody be successful. Uh, today is no different. Uh, I'm happy to have Amanda Varga with us. Uh, this is going to be an interesting call we've been looking forward to for a couple weeks. She is the owner of Caretrex, which is focused on supporting family caregivers of aging loved ones by providing the skills, knowledge, and resources that they need to be more confident and competent caregivers. Amanda's caregiving experience started at age 11 when she was the neighborhood babysitter Her first work with the elderly was in middle school as a volunteer candy striper at a local nursing home. Yes, the red and white striped uniforms with the cap. Yeah, those are uh, not too many of us remember those anymore. (laughs) But but while earning her bachelor degree in social work, um, she also provided specialized respite services for children with special needs. Immediately after graduation, she worked in a brain injury support supported living, quickly moving from direct care to management. After some years in the corporate world, primarily in HR and executive team roles, and having three amazing children, she found herself back in the professional caregiving realm as both an overnight awake hospice sitter and director of client care for a home care agency. Caregiving became more personal when she and her husband moved his uh, parents in with them in July 2014, both requiring 24-7 care and supervision with hands-on assistance. Amanda's personal caregiving journey has begun, and the following month, her three kids started 4th, 5th, and 12th grades. Wow, what a challenge. Life was complicated to say the least. It has been this personal experience with caregiving that has inspired the idea behind CareTracks to find a way to support others who find themselves in family caregiving role. So, Amanda, thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me, Roy. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've got a lot to unpack, and I think we had a we had a full episode length pre chat, and we've chatted, you know, multiple times before. Never, uh, uh, never a lack of a conversation for us to have because this is something that I think we, you know, both feel very passionate about. Mo- most of my adult life working has been spent in the senior living, you know, more on the business side with the analytics of sales and marketing and uh, financials, but still you know it's still dealing with this with this aspect of aging and so uh, I think you know first off I'm gonna get you to talk let me just say this T- tell us a little bit about your journey getting here first before we get too deep because you know it's interesting you've been on both sides of this equation and then you are uh, the typical typical sandwich generation is you know at one point you were caregiving for parents and you also had young children that still needed a lot of care when you have a fourth and fifth grade I mean that's you know the the twelfth grader they get where they can operate on their own and you know they're they're probably more happy to be distanced from mom and dad anyway but you know when you have young kids and and uh, and if they were in your home as you know all of this is going on in your home oh my gosh, you know, it's like, when, when do you ever get any rest? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. For at one point, I think we had a span of preteen to late eighties in our house between, yeah. between seven of us. So, wow. um, you know, the, the idea, I think that a lot of family caregivers have of, oh, well, we'll bring this care recipient into our home and won't it be great. We'll be that multi-generational family and, yeah. you know, it'll be good to have grandma and grandpa go to the sporting events and go to the concerts and that sort of thing. And you know, that, that's a fantastic dream. And for some people, it works. For us, it did not. You know, it actually turned out that we really had to balance the needs of our kids and the needs of our care recipients and the needs yeah. of work and home and all that kind of stuff, you know, and had to find a way to make everyone feel and be as loved as and, and important as they should. Yes. You know? yeah. So balancing that again with a 12th grader, yeah, there, there's a lot of independence there, but he ran track and cross country and I had been to every meet all through high school. And that's not a place to take someone who has significant mobility issues and doesn't want to go. Right. So then one parent is now going to a sporting event while the other is taking care of elders. And, you know, it's a tough split. It's a tough, um, it's a tough balance to manage there and make sure, you know, your kids need a lot from you as any parent knows that's a full job. Yes. Yes. Balancing that conflicting, just the conflicting pull on your time yeah. is, is stressful for, for any parent. Yeah, and it's important to distinguish uh, having your parents live with you 
and then having them live with you and needing significant care and attention because I was fortunate. Uh, you know, I'd lived away for a little bit when I moved back. Uh, my grandmother was still in very good health. She was probably in her late seventies, early, and this has been years ago, you know, and she would come out and stay with us, uh, you know, two, three days a week. Now the thing is she still had her home to go back to. So when she got tired of us, she could be like red flag, I'm ready to go home, but she was fully functional. We weren't providing care to her. So it's a totally different dynamic because she was actually a huge asset not only helping with the kids, but then also, you know, that intergenerational, you know, we were kind of living the dream, but the, the reality is, like you said, is that typically when you have parents or grandparents that have to move in with you, they have significant needs is what has triggered that. And so it just adds much more stress. And then, you know, I never even thought about that. The, um, maybe them not wanting to go to a track meet. And then now you've got to make a decision either, be the heavy and force them to go when it's tough anyway, or, you know, be miss out on your children's events. Right. Right. Exactly. You know, and the thing is, is even when there's a, like you had talked about with your grandmother and and it's a great situation, there really is that involvement and that independence. And yet that, that working together things can change so quickly. Yes. Yeah. That's what a lot of people um, are stunned by, yeah. you know, wow, we went from this person being able to drive herself home and back and forth and be involved in things to we're doing hands-on care yeah. or we need to find appropriate care. And, and that, that shift is often sudden yeah. and extremely stressful for yeah. everyone involved. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we talked a little bit about to, um, you know, where we are in this thing. COVID has shined a light on it because there were people that were approaching the need to go into some kind of a senior living assisted nursing, uh, maybe a Alzheimer's unit. And then with COVID, it was hard to get them in. Families didn't want to, you know, take the chance, but, you know, kind of setting that aside for a minute, I feel like we're kind of back in the sixties to seventies place when it was the, uh, you know, kind of the topic was when women entered the workforce very heavily, about having childcare and the difficulties of childcare. And it always f- f- fell to the mom to juggle, you know, the sitter, uh, the events, the work and all of that. But now we're kind of seeing that push become with, with our parents and taking care of elders in our families is that it's become, it's begun to be a strain on our workforce. I mean, people have had to leave the workforce, which is a personal, uh, burden with the lost income, but also companies are losing a lot of good people. Right. Definitely. I mean, it, it, the norm now is that women are in the workforce, even when they're parents, right. You know, there, there's ways to help pay for childcare. There's, there's medical leave, there's family leave, there's all of these different options, but what isn't being recognized as much now is the need for that same type of caregiving, but for a different generation. Now right. they're caring for parents or grandparents and aunts and uncles and that sort of thing. Yeah. And that's what we're looking for to have employers start to recognize that because, yeah. you know, statistically, if, if an organization is actually doing exit interviews, about a third of people who are leaving left because of care for an elder, oh, wow. you know, and that, that's a big hit. So we need yeah. to find a way to help, um, help employers support those employees Yeah, and, and, and either keep them in the or, you know, work around what they have going on. Yeah. And that's, you've got a twofold mission. Number one, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you, um, you will help caregivers and help structure things that they need to do to be that caregiver and self care and do what they need. But you also really are focusing now on working with businesses to help give them plans to be a resource for them. So tell us a little bit about that. Sure. It's, it's actually, it's a blend of my, my background. I have a human resources background. I was a PHR, which is professional human resources. I was a certified HR generalist and I loved, my favorite part was benefits management. I loved putting together the package, making sure my employees were using everything we were offering, right? Being that expert for them. And then blending that with my experience as a personal caregiver, a family caregiver for the last almost seven years now, we, we're still family caregivers. And the work I've done in the senior services industry on, on the business side of it, yeah. bringing all that together because there's a huge discrepancy between how employers view the impact of caregiving on their bottom line and how employees realize that impact. Um, 
you know, there's between being, you know, late to work, leaving, needing to leave early, there's absenteeism, you know, when someone's not there, yeah. but there's presenteeism. You know, when someone is sitting there at work, they're physically there, but they're distracted or they're sick or they're tired, or they're anxious. And all of those things are leading to loss of productivity and increase in turnover. And if we can find a way to support those working family caregivers yeah. through their employer, so it's an easy resource to find. They don't have to go Googling for it. They know it's available through their workforce right. or their workplace um, to get them those resources, to educate them on the things they may need and how their situation may change and, and what resources are available um, for their loved one. Yeah. yeah and, you know, uh, We've talked prior, but, you know, retention is a hot button for me. And that was why, you know, it, it, extremely side, excited to have you come on, because um, I think the, the biggest thing for me is that conversation. It, it's the one that never happens because I wait. Typically, employers wait until the exit interview, till the decision's already made and we're already on this path or the person just it was a no call, no show. And we're looking for them. And this is why I, you know, I encourage employers, managers, whoever will, to know who your employees are. You have to know about their life, and you can't get any more personal than they want you to. But if I know that my employee has an elderly person that they're dealing with, that maybe you know, I see a change in their attitude, a change in work, we can talk and say, "Hey, you know what's going on," and have this conversation before we lose the talent because you know it's uh the last year has been a little different with uh being able to find employees there's been a plethora of people that are looking for work but you know prior to this pandemic the workforce was tight i mean and it was hard businesses were struggling to find people good people to fill slots and so it's going to get that way again, I, I feel certain, but that's why this is so important. It's not only to provide that for the, the individual just because we're good humans, but it's also good, a good business decision because we don't want to lose the talent. Right. Recruiting and retaining, right? Those, right. those are huge costs to an employer that not everyone is aware of. Right. You know, I think even not not some of the, the business owners themselves don't have the real the realization of what the cost is uh, yeah. to put together a job description, to get it posted, to screen through applicants, to interview the applicants. Yeah. And then once you have someone to onboard them, train them, get them all the way up to speed, yeah. that takes a lot of time and a lot of money. And yeah. if we can instead focus on the amazing employees that organizations have, and those employees may be struggling with other obligations, let's find a way to support them. Right. And work on that retention piece, but then also it's something that can be used as a recruiting tool. Yep. You know, a lot of companies are very focused on their company culture these yeah. days, and here's our culture and here's what we offer. We offer extra benefits to our employees and having a component in there that encourages family caregivers of aging loved ones to apply, to know this is a good place for me to go. They yeah. understand better than others what may be going on in my life. I right. think that's incredibly important because those employees they're afraid to talk to management, Yeah, you know, because if I tell you that, well, my mom has moved in with us and it's kind of challenging, then when that promotion comes up or that transfer comes up, you have in the back of your mind as an employer, maybe this is more than they can handle. Maybe right. we'll pass them right. up this time. I'm doing them a favor when that employee really wants to make this work. So, you know, it, it's about that open conversation, like you said. Yeah. And I think, um, when we talk about company culture, the first thing a lot of people think about is the ping pong table or the, uh, you know, exactly. Frappuccino machine that, you know, maybe we could get that at a later date, but to add a benefit like this and, and, you know, I've got the numbers on that. When we talk about retention, you know, I put the figure and I don't, it's research that I've gathered over the years, but it costs you about four, uh, to 4,000 to $7,500 to turn over a $10 hour employee. And there are some estimates that put that up over $10,000. And then once we start working up the ladder, you know, managers about 100 to 125% of their salary till we get, you know, tech workers can be 400% uh, of their salary. And then once we get to the C-suite, you know, we're talking about two to two, two to 250% of their salary. So these costs are significant. I mean, that is cash outlay. That's a significant cost. 
not to mention just the fact of not having enough people to fulfill your product or service. So there are all kinds of ramifications on the back end. And I do like that, you know, to use this as a recruiting tool because it, I think it softens the company. It makes us, uh, it makes Hopefully you are. I don't don't want to put up a facade, but hopefully it makes it it lets people know that you are a human friendly company and that we care about our employees. You know that that it's genuine and not just you know lip service exactly. And you know your point to the the C suite, those higher level folks. Statistically speaking, they are the ones who are more likely to just flat out walk away and leave the workforce completely. Yeah. If there's a conflict between work and and caregiving, right? You know, those are the folks they've they've made their money. They probably have a great retirement plan. They they've made their mark in the world. They're there now because they enjoy it. Yeah. Um, they, they've reached that pinnacle. And when it comes to do I stay here or you know, mom's had a stroke and she really needs me right now. They're going to leave right. and get that two week notice. If that from your CFO, that's more than just someone's walking out the door. That's yeah. industry knowledge. That's experience. That's customer relationships. So if, like you said, if we can start having that conversation before the conflict reaches the breaking point, right. And how can we job share? How can we provide support that this person is comfortable with? Yeah. How can we maybe scale back their hours and, and do something else? So either, either there's not an immediate transition or it's a longer transition and it's smoother for the company and they can be a part of bringing in their replacement. So, um, yeah, there, there's a lot of unseen costs yeah. to having someone walk out the door. Yeah. And I think that with, um, you know, what we've seen over this last year is that you can accomplish a lot through teams. And so, you know, if I can find a quiet spot, you know, even if I am having to provide a little bit more care, is it, you know, am I a valuable enough employee? Do I add enough, um, to the you know value to the whole organization that do you really need me sitting in the same room with you to have this conversation can we be doing it virtually also the flex hours that uh you know if i'm researching or doing a spreadsheet does it matter if i'm doing that at three in the afternoon or at eight or nine at night uh you know right. those are the kind of things that we have to weigh to see and uh, it's a little bit it wasn't for the caregiving reason, but it's a great example. I, I knew somebody that was a, a nursing home administrator and she lost one of her best people. No call, no show, just disappeared in the wind. And so after a couple of days, you know, she, the, the administrator actually cared about her as a person, but she cared about her to her workforce because she was so good for their residents. That, so she actually went out and tracked this lady down and, Unfortunately, there had been a change in the family situation. So once she talked to her, she said, look, I didn't want to call in to my boss and get hassled because of this situation. She said, it's easier for me just to quit, deal with this, and then go get another job. Because, you know, at that point, the job were interchangeable. She could go do something. But anyway, after having a conversation they were able to work out a, f a different schedule for a short period of time to allow this lady to come back. And it was like a conversation. That was all it is. So anyway, I think, you know, yeah. and it's both sides. It's not just employers, but it's employees as well. But you have to have this bond of trust somewhere in the middle that both parties feel comfortable talking about things like this. Right. And, and, you know, it's funny because I, I actually lived a piece of that because when we moved my in-laws in with us, I was planning on still working. We thought that having them here under our roof and us kind of overseeing was going to be enough. And, you know, it turns out it wasn't. I, I left the workforce completely, became their 24-7 caregiver. Yeah. And after probably the first two years or so, my a previous employer had stayed in touch. Right. You know, he had known us well, knew, knew what was going on and started calling every now and then and emailing saying, how's it going? I know you wouldn't you like to get out of your house for a little bit? You know, I know you need to think, you know, yeah. you need to use the other faculties that you have besides just the physical caregiving. And we went back and forth because I, I didn't know if I could really be a benefit to him. And he was sure I could. And, it, you know, but managing that time, and finally, we came to an agreement. Like, Let's try it. Let's yeah. see, you, know, you come in, give me what you can, and, you know, and I'll pay you nine hours a week is where it started back, you know, three hours a day, three days a week. And, that's about as unconventional as you're going to get in, right. in a lot of organizations, but it gave them what they needed. They needed certain things for me that I had done for them in the past that worked really well. 
And it did. It got me out of the house. Right. And a family caregiver who was feeling so overwhelmed with the physicality of what I was doing. Yeah. It was really great to think, you know, and there were there was a time or two when I called and said, we were in the ER. We just had a really rough night. I can't come in today. Yeah. But let me figure out another time to come in. And by the same token, they knew if they really needed something, I would find a way to rearrange things at home. Right. right. But employers aren't open to, again, having that conversation and saying, you're valued enough for us to figure something out. We know right. your situation and we want to work with you right. in spite of it and with it. Yeah. Uh, I, I think more of that needs to be happening and to realize that that really can benefit business itself yeah. to bring those people back. Yeah. And I think as a, um, you know, as an older, uh, as an older white guy, I don't understand because, um, well, I understand because I've read the statistics, but a lot of people don't understand because typical caregiving duties fall to the daughter-in-law. And that's just, the, <laughs> I mean, and you're, you're living yep. proof of that, but that's the way it is. It's like, uh, you know, the, the daughter-in-law, the, you know, the, hu the husband's wife takes care of her family and his family. And that's not a, you know, that's not just me looking around. There's empirical data that actually spells that out, that that's how that goes. And so I think it's not, you know, it's stopping for a minute to realize the position that this person is put into. And if you've never been a caregiver, it's probably one of the most difficult jobs that there is. And that's why there's such high turnover in, uh, you know, the higher in acuity nursing homes and um, uh, memory care units. That's why you have such high turnovers because the work is hard, the pay is not that good, and it's an emotional toll. And again, even if it's your family, it still takes an emotional toll. You you don't want to see their uh, getting worse, the digression in their health and circumstances, the more care that you provide. So anyway, a lot of a lot of things go into that that we, if you've never been in that position, you just don't get it. And so kind of gets back to the relation between the chill, you know, women and children at one point, it was the same thing. It's like, Hey, it, you know, I want to be good. I can be productive, but I'm the one that has to deal with this, you know, the child situation full time. Right. Right. And you know, so like, like you said, there's, there's the physical toll you're working, you know, it's, yeah. it's physicality, whether you're sitting behind a desk or you're providing hands-on care for your work. Yeah. There's the emotional toll and the mental toll. And there's a lot of guilt, you know, yeah. for family caregivers. Like I had talked about, if I'm spending time with my kids, am I not spending enough time with my care recipients? Right. If I'm taking time to go to work because I enjoy it and I need that release, am I not doing enough at home? Right. Or if I'm at home, am I not doing enough to try and stretch myself to bring in, you know, money to help financially support this family? No matter yeah. what a caregiver does. There's yeah. always something else they could be doing. It's just as good. Yeah. But always wondering which in my, did I make the right choice today or in yeah. general? And so that mental toll is, it's huge. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. really it follows you everywhere. And that's the interaction with the individuals. I mean, even if we cut that off the plate, there's still the, you know, 12 loads of laundry that are piled up and the house needs dusting again. And, you know, all those day to day chores that just seem to pile up as well. So yeah, it, it's a true thing. And I think you had a, did you have a study that you were, a couple studies that you wanted to reference? So the, the history behind why, why I reference this is I had put together the idea of bringing caregiving and senior services into the workplace as an employer benefit and had put, was putting together more of the marketing. How do I promote this? And finally really started digging. Maybe there's some statistics with employees and workforce. I know it and I've seen it, but yeah. I don't know if anyone's actually studied it and found a study done by Harvard Business School of all places. Uh, they put this out in 2017, so it's pre-COVID, but it's still very applicable. Um, they were really looking at the discrepancy between how employees feel and know caregiving is impacting their productivity at work and how employers view it. And that, that uh. gap is actually significant. <laughs> yeah. Most employers are ignoring it. They either don't see it or they're not going to acknowledge it. They don't think it's a big deal. And for employees, it's a huge impact on their work and home life. And that's why there's so much turnover in there. And I was rereading re this morning. They have an executive summary. It's a proper study. And, oh, just to back up, I, when I found this study, first of all, I was thrilled. It was, if I paid someone to fabricate a study to support what I was <laughs> doing, they couldn't have done it better. And yeah. here it's Harvard. 
Um, and I had emailed, I had nothing to lose. So I emailed the authors of the study and explained what I was doing and how thrilled I was to find their study and asked permission. May I use your statistics if I properly reference it and that sort of thing. And they, they gave me free reign. They said, yes, please promote this as much as you can. So oh, awesome. I, am reading with, I am reading with permission. Okay. Okay. <laughs> A study by Harvard Business School called The Caring Company, and the authors are Joseph Fuller and Manjari Rahman. And this is just the opening to the executive summary that, that talks to employers. So brief read here. American companies are facing a caregiving crisis. They just refuse to acknowledge it. Rising health care and professional caregiving costs and changing demographics over the past few decades have put great pressure on American employees as they try to balance work and care responsibilities. Yet many employers remain largely oblivious to the growing costs of this hidden care economy, costs that hurt employers and employees alike. While companies spend time, money, or sorry, money, time, and effort on providing benefits, often those benefits are of little use to employees. By not offering benefits that employees actually want, and by not encouraging employees to use the benefits they do offer, companies incur millions of dollars in hidden costs due to employee turnover, loss of institutional knowledge, and temporary hiring in addition to substantial productivity costs such as absenteeism and presenteeism. The spectrum of care from child care to elder care ranges across every demographic in the organization. Workers of all ages and levels of seniority are affected. Given the lack of support at work, many employees hide the growing burden of caregiving responsibilities. They struggle to balance the responsibilities of working caregiving, often dealing with the unexpected and recurring care obligations that require mental, physical, and financial resources to address them. Individual productivity suffers accordingly, inflicting a cost on the employer. Then when the emotional and physical stress becomes too much, their capacity for work becomes impaired. Some respond by reining in their ambitions. Others reduce their working hours. Still others drop out of the workforce altogether. Eventually employers often pay another major cost. They lose talented trained employees. So exactly what we've been talking about in this study is, you know, probably 60, 70 pages long, I think, and uh, goes into how they, they researched with so many employees and, and took their, their impressions of how caregiving is impacting them, you know, and 75% of the workforce at that point was impacted by caregiving. Yeah. And that, again, that spanned the ages, you know, new births and adoptions, special needs kids and into elder care. But of that 75%, 80% of them uh, said it's having a significant impact. And, you know, about a third of people leaving, like I mentioned before, leave because of caring for an older family member or an older loved one. Yeah. And that's a huge hit. You know, we've already covered the turnover costs and what that what that does to the bottom line of, of, of an organization. So right. if we can find a way, you know, and that's what Care Trucks is all about, is to bring these resources in, not as your traditional EAP, right? Where you call an 800 number and <laughs> they give you a couple other 800 numbers yeah. to call in your area. Right. This is meant to be personal and local. So that if you have an employee who is taking on caregiving um, for us, you know, in the Denver area and, you know, here's what they need and here's what my care recipient is experiencing. It's, it's dementia or it's, you know, loss of mobility. All right. Let's talk about the varieties of care that are available. Let's talk about what placement agents do. Let's talk yeah. about what home care does versus home health and palliative and hospice. Let's see what you need in your family situation to help you better balance what's going on in your life. Right. Yeah. And the other part is this isn't just um, it's not just theory. You've lived it. And so I think that that just adds that much more credibility, uh, you know, to the advice that you can give to these individuals, because sometimes that's just what we need. It's a starting point. I mean, this just happened. And the sometimes events with seniors happen in a gradual manner. And even and a lot of times, even if it does happen in a gradual manner, it builds up to one point where it's an emergency or a crisis. And so typically we need answers yesterday, not I got another week to call, you know, like you said, multiple 800 numbers, talk to 12 other people. I need answers and I need it now. And then the, also right. it's that anxiety. It's like, well, you know, what, I can't let the situation go on for a couple more days because there's somebody, maybe their life is at stake or the, at least their quality of living. And so, uh, you know, having that resource to reach out to and talk about, but I think, um, you know, to me, uh, that's a beneficial tool for sure. But I really think that your value is going to be educating 
management that this number one, this exists. Number two, it's a huge toll on your business. And number three, there is a solution. It, it's a simple yeah. solution, you know. And like you said, encouraging those conversations. If, if an employer knows or employee knows that their workplace is, you know, it's all about safe spaces these days. But right. if this is a, a safe place to talk about and say, hey, my my mother-in-law is starting to decline. We're not sure what we're going to do. Right. Wow. If that person can be connected to education and resources at that point to say, well, here are your options. Yeah. Here's Here's what's available where your mom lives versus where you live if you want to move her in. Here's some things we can start working on far ahead of time right. so that a month or two down the road when that crisis point has happened yeah. and a decision has to be made no one's making it in a panic we've already laid out some plans and it can be a smoother transition and there's not that again that that panic crisis mode of okay now we have to do something yesterday yeah <laughs> Instead, right. it's, this is where it looks like we're heading and if an employee knows there's someone they can easily access have that conversation ahead of time to plan ahead and the employer is proactive with saying we want you to access this as soon as you think you might need it right or before we can head off a lot of that stress yeah yeah and um i just lost my thought it was a good one. Oh It'll my gosh back. yeah <laughs> i guess it will uh but yeah um so anyway let's uh well goodness i've just totally drawn a blank it was such a good question too. Anyway, so uh, the other part of this too is like the uh, the dealing with kids. I mean, it's like okay for you, and that's what I think. Another thing that we have to take into consideration is nowadays. Oh, I know. Sorry, I just had my my thought came back. I just read a study this morning that said uh, it was basically saying since 1950 to 1977, we extended the our lifespan in general due to medicine and medication and things like that but it was just trying to promote the fact that we it's become too costly to continue that so there's this cost benefit that we're losing but it was just saying that if we're going to extend it another 10 years in the future that this is all going to come back to lifestyle and so it's not only lifestyle of the the seniors that we're caring for i think we have to look at the lifestyle of the individual providing the care because of the high stress i mean and uh there's a, again this isn't my thinking this there's empirical evidence that says and i've seen a couple studies but when you have a very high need care individual let's say somebody with dementia and you're providing all the care at home the caregiver will typically die 60 to 70 percent before the individual who's got the dementia diagnosis. Yeah, it's, it's, there's so much stress and pressure put on the, the care recipient or the yeah. caregiver, you know, and, and yes, I'm, it's hard to promote self care for others when I'm still working on it myself. Yeah. You know, I make sure that my kids get to all their doctor's appointments and that my care recipients got to their doctor's appointments and they have appropriate care and, and, you know, the meals are as appropriate as possible for what they may need. And I haven't been to the doctor for anything other than an urgent need right. for probably six years, right. you know, and I know that's wrong. I know I need to prioritize yeah. that, but it is, it just, it feels almost self-indulgent. And that's something for caregivers, you know, myself included, that we need to get over that taking care of ourselves and taking time to step back, making sure our physical needs are met is not indulgent. It's necessary yeah. because what happens when we fall apart and we've had that. I have been laid out just sick as a dog because yeah. my body finally said you're done. And you know, then everything else kind of falls apart. And the, it, it is, it's the constant. Yeah. You know, when you're working in the caregiving industry as a profession, it's stressful as well, but you're able to go home and decompress to right. a certain extent. You have, you have this safe place to go to, to, to relax and put your feet up. When you are a caregiver in your home or in a loved one's home, or even if you're overseeing their care locally, you know, you stop by mom's place after work every day, or, or right. you check on dad every morning before you go in, there is, it, it, it's so many layers of responsibility. Yeah. And, you know, that does, it, it kind of drags someone down, even when they don't notice it, they're just, they're plowing through because, oh, this can't, maybe they, they think this can't last that long. I right. can do this for a little while. Right. As you said, we're living longer and that little while 
can, can be a whole lot longer than we anticipate. And yeah, the stress on the caregiver is, is significant. Yeah, because the, uh, you know, even though dementia diagnoses are terrible, uh, people can linger for 8, 10, 12 years in that state, and it just gets worse and worse and worse. And so it's not like you said, sometimes that it's that time horizon or we start care at home and then it, it makes it even harder to try to get them, you know, outside help. Let's just say, you know, move into a dementia unit or something like that. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, another cost center that you just brought up too is the, you know, uh, the, the health of the worker, you know, now, you know, they're, they're burning the candle at both ends. They get sicker more often. And I think that is, uh, it's really guidance that you can also give them too is on that self care. And, you know, it's like, do as I say, not as I do. We're all that way. We don't, you know, we don't follow our own advice. I'm working for sure. on it. Yeah. I'm getting much better. <laughs> right. We don't follow our own advice, but you know, there are things that you have to do, you know, there. And the other thing a lot of people don't understand, I think is that there are respite providers and this is a general message for anybody who is a caregiver, are there are places that you can take your loved one for a day, a week, to be able to have a night out, to be able to take a vacation with the family. But there are short-term solutions that a lot of people just are unaware of, which totally beneficial. And even day programs. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, mm -hmm. a, they call it adult day, adult daycare there's a lot of things, but there's a there and the one I want to talk about for a minute. It was a um, because I'm old enough to remember the old nursing home models where it was just old people sitting around really in bad shape and it right. was not pretty. But there's a place out of Houston and there's these I know there are places all over that do this, but this was just a model that their uh, their participants, as they put it, would. They had art projects. They went to art museums. They were out doing stuff, and it was so uh, stimulating for the people that partake in it. But also, it was a good um, peace of mind for that caregiver that you were dropping them off at a place that they love to go, and that was very good for them. You know, not some place mm -hmm. you drop them off and you just cross your fingers that everything's going to be okay for a couple hours. Right. Care, care can be so much more specialized now. Again, when you talk about the, the idea many people have in their head of a nursing home, and that's yeah. all they see, where everyone is kind of lumped together. Right. There's, there's a wing or an area for the worst off folks, but then everyone is still in the same, same arena. And now care communities are often so specialized. You know, there's memory care, there's assisted living, there's independent living, there's transitional living. And even within those day programs, like yeah. you said, there are some that specifically cater to a dementia diagnosis yeah. to do what they can both mentally and physically for this person to stave off the progression as long as possible. Right. Um, and then other programs, you know, through like an in of age pace program where the, the participants can receive care on site. They can see their doctor on site. They can even have CNAs providing showers on site. So the family doesn't need to take care of that level of personal care. They can go to work. And then they can come home and have dinner and be a part of that evening routine. And uh, there are a lot of solutions available. There's even funding available that a lot of mm -hmm. folks don't realize. There are some great grant programs that help fund respite for families, even yeah. for a short period of time. And I can tell you, we didn't take a family vacation with our kids for four, about four years after wow. we became yeah. family caregivers. And <clears throat> the, you know, the guilt, of course, of leaving our care recipients in a community for two weeks was there, but the joy of being with just our children and focusing yeah. on our core family, we should have done it much earlier. Yeah. You know, it makes us better caregivers to focus on ourselves every now and then. We came back ready to take it on again. Yeah. You know, we had gotten away and that was really important. And yeah. families need to realize again that's not an indulgence, it's a necessity. Yeah. And you know, we have we have slowly started making sure we're doing those things as well. Yeah, and I think that's important. You know, again it, it's, I look at it as being a care coach, you know, you're there, you could be there for those individuals to say, you know, what's going on in life right now? Have you been on that vacation? Have you had that respite? Sometimes all we need is that little reminder, like, Hey, you know what? We haven't really had a day off. You know, why don't we do that? 
it will help us in so many aspects of our life, but also our health because, <clears throat> you know, the stress that we feel dealing with all this, it, it uh, we do pay a price for that and it will take a toll on us in some manner. We don't, we, we can't escape that. Uh, yeah. The other big word that I've heard you mention a couple times is guilt. And so that is a huge component of this. One part I want to talk about a little bit is that decision to move an individual from a house to more of a facility. And it's not easy. It's not for everybody. I don't recommend, uh, you know, my, even though I spent a lot of time in that industry, my personal views are that people need to be where they're comfortable, where they can get the care that they need. And that if that's in home in in a loved one's home or at a community, whatever works best. And, um, but at some point, typically at some point in this process, you do have to make that move. So just for a few minutes, I know we could talk another show about that, but let's just, you know, we need to get over the guilt of that. And we need to realize that if we are doing the right thing for our loved one, we should feel guilt free, even though we said we'd never put you in a place like that, or we think that they're more comfortable at home especially with uh, people that start to wander or become uh, uh, threats to themselves in some manner. So anyway, I'll let you expand on that just a little bit. Well, and I think, you know, the, the first thing is that with that older generation, when they think of don't put me in a home, it is what we were just talking about, that that older version of a nursing home where right. it, it, they weren't overly pleasant places to be. Right. And having made their, their children – make that promise many, right. many, many years ago. Don't ever do that to me. Right. A lot has changed in over many, many decades. And I think it's important for family caregivers to know that sometimes fulfilling that promise of I will take care of you means finding appropriate placements because not every adult human being is cut out to be a caregiver, right? right. Not everyone is cut out to be <clears throat> an, an engineer. Not everyone is cut out to be a scientist. Not everyone is cut out to be a caregiver. And sometimes the best ways you can most effectively care for your loved one is to help find for them the best possible place for them to live, given your geography, given your financial circumstances, given their physical and mental and emotional needs, but then to still be involved. Because if you're not someone who's comfortable with giving mom a shower, taking mom to the bathroom, being up with her three or four times a night, but you do know she enjoys your company. So have someone else take on the physical part of the caregiving and you make sure you're sharing a meal with her a couple times a week. You're taking her out to her favorite restaurant or to a movie. You're picking her up and taking her to church with your family. Right. You're still involved. You're still overseeing the care. You're one of those families who the community knows you're gonna show up on a regular basis. And yeah. you know, no matter what, and, and you know the industry, if, if caregivers on a professional end know that that family shows up often and unexpectedly, yeah. there's just that little extra bit of care because what if Mrs. Jones' son shows up today? Let's make sure you look pretty oh today. Let's, let's put extra effort in. And, you know, it's a thing that the more involved the family <laughs> is, probably the better care that the, um, the care recipient is going to get. So yeah. be involved, but don't necessarily force yourself into the personal care that you're not comfortable with or you're not skilled at. Yeah. You're still taking care of your loved one. And, and that is a tough hurdle to overcome, that taking care of may mean they're not in your home. Right. Yeah, and it's funny you mention that because even, you know, my mom's still in good health, but even when I go to church with her, and it's she still introduces me to everybody and the you know the people get tired they're like oh my god we've met this guy 25 times already you know but she's all <laughs> you know even she's and I don't think we uh, we don't stop and think about the joy that we bring uh you know to our parents or our loved ones just doing one yeah. little thing like that just showing up at her church uh you know it means the world to her that because her church is her life and so you know having our uh kids be involved in something that we enjoy there's nothing better than that so one other yeah. thing and that so uh, oh go ahead i'm sorry i wrote my ideal down no, now I, so I i'm not going to forget so it our, <laughs> <laughs> so, so many of our care recipients honestly never expected when they had that conversation with their kids don't you know make sure you're taking care of me didn't expect to live as long as they did right as long as they 
you know, because like you said, life expectancy has been stretched. And would mom, would dad really have wanted you to completely have, have such upheaval in your life in order to take care of them when they ended up being around 20 years longer than they thought they would? Right. You know, it's not just the of will you take care of me? But, you know, as a parent, we, we don't want our children to have to put their lives on hold or take a completely different direction for our sake. Right. You know, I can say is that current sandwich generation, I am making different decisions in my midlife than my, my care recipients did yeah. simply because I don't want my children to be in the same position I'm in. Right. <laughs> you know, right. I'm very clear with them. Yeah. We have had a lot of those conversations. Like this is not what I want for you. Yeah. You can find alternative <laughs> options for me because this is not the life that I want for right. you. And, and I think those are important conversations to have as well. If we really think about it, do our parents want us to have done what we're doing, yeah. you know, or should we be integrating them into our lives, but not allowing their care to overtake it, you know, and yeah. that, that's fine line sometimes. Yeah. And having that, starting that conversation now and, you know, absolving your kids of that responsibility, I think it's huge. It's like, you know, I just, I want what's best for you, for me, just you know, I'm, I'm happy. Come by and see me every now and then, you know, that'll be fine. So, <laughs> exactly. but, um, one other part that we brought up, you know, we talk about stress kind of with the, um, work and everything that's going on, but something else that was typical is that, uh, when we get stressed and when we get stressed to this breaking point, that's typically when we lash out. And there were studies through uh, the Department of Health here that caregiver abuses usually came, especially in institutions, they usually came when employees had doubled over or were working crazy long shifts and they were just stressed to the max. And so that, that applies to us even in our personal caregiving journey. The more stress we get because work has got these responsibilities I'm trying to handle. We got kids that have activities we're getting to, the laundry, the dinner, the you know, the third the you know, the extra child, the husband's like, Hey, when's dinner gonna be you know, when's <laughs> dinner gonna be ready? You know. So is that all this stuff it and then we can lash out to, at the person that we're caring for more or the potential is there, not everybody, but the potential is there. And so this is another great reason for this respite self-care. If we're in a good place, then of course we handle things better, but uh, we, we just don't want to say or do something that we will uh, regret because we've mm -hmm. let ourselves get to that point. Yeah. And, and I think often in those circumstances, the, the more stress we're getting, the more likely we are to think, mom's doing this on purpose yeah you know if there's a dementia diagnosis then we knew how she was for all of those many many years and she cared for everyone and maybe there were those personality conflicts as there are between kids and parents yeah and it suddenly becomes that bitterness of she's doing this on purpose she's right. repeating that question on purpose i told her that 20 times and we start blaming the person as opposed to the disease process that they are going through yeah. and level of frustration. And I think that's where education and support certainly come into play and yeah. the ability to step back. You know, when, when you're a new parent, right, you're educated that if you have reached that point, you put your child in the crib or the playpen or wherever it is, put them in a safe place, let them cry, walk away for a little bit. Right. When you're working with a care recipient who is mobile you know, they're ambulatory, they can do whatever. It's a little harder to say, I'm going to leave you right here and walk away because you might fall. You know, yeah. now we're both upset and they're feeding off of your anxiety and it's just that yeah. bad cycle. But have someone else go sit in that room for a little bit, you know, and talk about who knows what. Change the channel on the TV, hand them a cookie and a glass of milk, anything to distract them so you can step back and break that cycle. But it's hard, you know. Yeah. Human beings kind of thrive on that negativity. Yeah. <laughs> we have to be above it enough to know when to say, you're right. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Let's, let's have a bowl of ice cream. Yeah. And it's hard to yeah. do. <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, before we wrap it up, did you have another uh, study that you wanted to reference before we go? Uh, you know, I just come across one. I haven't had time to go through it all. It's about 107 pages. Okay. Okay. But, um, for any employers who are wondering and wanting to uh, 
to do a little research on their own as well. So we have the caring company from Harvard, but AARP had a research report just called Caregiving in the U.S. 2020. Okay. And it's also really just supporting everything that we've been talking about and giving a little bit more recent statistics and um, especially talking about I focused on that, that impact between employee and employer, the working caregivers, that sort of thing. And the help that caregivers need. One, one thing that jumped out at me was that 62% of caregivers need help with at least one caregiving topic. You know, there's at least one thing that they aren't sure of. And the top two, they actually tied at 26% were keeping their care recipient safe at home and managing their own emotional and physical stress. Those are the wow. top two things that caregivers are wanting information on. I mean, there's, you know, end, end of life uh, discussions and paperwork and eligibility and things to do with their care recipient. But the top two things are how do I keep this person safe at home and how do I deal with what I'm dealing with? And I think it's important to know that if we can, again, bring a resource to these folks easy rather than having them need to search and find out what happens to be out there but make it a single phone call to say, well, what do I do? Right. And get connected to resources. It's just really important. There's a lot of need out there and there are so many resources, but they're not finding each other. And that's right. really what CareTrex is meant to do is to bridge that gap okay. and get the right people to the right resources. Yeah. Awesome. And that's kind of where I was going to go next, but uh, before we get to that even, so um, what is a tool? Is there, is there a tool or a habit, something that you do every day that helps add value to your life? Maybe even, helps with this caregiving component that you're providing? Uh, and it depends on the day. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I think it's really the realization of how stressed I was, especially in those first couple of years. You know, I've done this professionally. You know, I you would think that that would translate easily into, you know, home life. And it doesn't always. It's a different circumstance when it's, it's your own family members and it's yeah. in your own home. But the lessons I learned in those first couple of years about taking care of myself uh, have been incredibly important. And, and I'm, I'm definitely a, a woman of faith. And so having that daily devotion, that time to step back and, and kind of focus my day, yeah. um, I'm, I'm a list maker. Yeah. <laughs> I love checking things off the yeah. list, but, you know, calendars and, and feeling like I'm organized really helps. But also knowing when to call yeah. and say, hey, uh, this has changed. What do I do? Yeah. And making it okay to reach out. I've, we've had things go wrong in our house early in the morning and I've canceled my professional day. Like, I'm so sorry. You guys know I'm a caregiver and that has to take priority now and being right. okay with making a phone call and yeah. figuring it out later. So there's not one thing I don't think, but other than knowing yourself and your situation and understanding those resources. Okay. All right. Well, again, I know you just touched on it, but a repeat again, if you don't mind, just, you know, who are, who can you help? course how can you help them and how can they reach out and get a hold of you sure so we'll start with reaching out and getting a hold so care tracks <laughs> c-a-r-e-t-r-e-k-s i get a lot of care tracks and it's oh, care okay. tracks um the website's easy it's care .com. i'm on linkedin amanda varga bsw i have a social work degree i've got an instagram it's under care tracks as well those are all great ways to to reach out and get to me uh, on the employer side the focus right now really is bringing these resources into the workplace and that the cost of bringing in a benefit like this is minimal compared to even a single employee turning over and needing to recruit a new one. And if you're going to talk the talk of having this great culture and we support our employees, this is a component that needs to be added to it to, right. to help support those employees as they become caregivers. And even if right now a workforce they, they don't see a whole lot of that. Um, oh, well, only 10% of my employees say they're caregivers right now. Well, those 10% are saying it. There's probably quite a few who aren't. Right. And it doesn't mean they won't be tomorrow because mom or dad having a stroke or having a fall or experiencing an illness happens suddenly. You don't, you don't get two weeks notice on that. And yeah. people find themselves in situations that are going to require their, their efforts and their time being put elsewhere. So let's make resources accessible. Yeah. Let's make access to information easy yep. through the employer. Yeah. And just for goodness sake, have the conversation, like you said, maybe 10% have verbalized it, but there's probably another 10 or 20% that have been scared to say anything. And, 
again, another great point is things change on a dime. You know, you're, as you're going through life, it's all good, but all it takes is one fall, one incident, and all of a sudden you're put in that position. And so, you know, how to deal with it. So anyway, y'all reach out. If you're a business, reach out. Talk to Amanda, see how she can help you provide this benefit for your employees. But also, if you're struggling with that, um, you know, being a caregiver with self-care, with some of those things, reach out. She'll be able to help you in that respect as well. So thanks so much for taking time out of your day to be here. Certainly do appreciate it. That's going to do it for another episode of the Business of Business podcast. Of course, I am your host, Roy, and um, we are on all the major podcast platforms iTunes, Stitcher, Google, Spotify. If we're not on one that you listen to, please reach out. Uh, We're on all the major social media platforms as well as at www.thebusinessofbusinesspodcast.com. So till next time, take care of yourself and take care of your business.